Well, my name is John Masseri, and I'm the executive director of OPCC. Do you mind if I sit? I'm more comfortable doing this. Is that OK? Um, and my colleague, Donna Miller, who's really the brains behind the operation, she just brings me along to carry stuff. Um, <laughs> But um, seriously, we're really happy to be here today and um, tell you a little bit about OPCC and the work that we're doing. Um, and then Sarah asked me to talk a little bit about kind of homelessness generally and what's going on in the city of Santa Monica. I assume um, you've been here long enough. If you walk around in the downtown area, you don't have to go very far to be very aware that uh, we have a lot of people living on the streets here in Santa Monica. And, I know we get asked as a service provider, you know, what, what's, why are people homeless? What's the city doing about that? Um, so hopefully I can answer some of your questions. And then at the end, I'd like to talk about volunteer opportunities that we have available um, at our organization and ways that you might be able to get involved. So um, just um, for your own information on the back, um, there's a lot of information here. We have volunteer opportunities. There's one of our newsletters. Um, and then a real quick fact sheet about OPCC. Um, and then this little card actually has a client, a, a really heartwarming, true client story on it as well. So please feel free to take that information on your way out. Um, so OPCC, the story of OPCC is, really begins uh, 40, more than 43 years ago. We've been in Santa Monica since 1963. And actually, um, before that, in the late 1950s, um, Santa Monica was a very different community than it is now. The Ocean Park area, which is, the, for those of you familiar with the city, is the south part of the city, um, is where primarily um, working poor families lived. Um, in, there was a time, actually, that there were um, deed restrictions, covenant restrictions on, on owning property along the beach. Um, and so a lot of the um, um, people who worked in the service industry and their families lived in the south part of the city. And the church in Ocean Park, which is a Methodist congregation that's been there since about 1897, I believe, um, had a, a building on its property that was a, had been used as a church parsonage and had been sitting vacant for quite a long time. And so the, uh, there were several people who lived in the neighborhood that asked the church if they could use the house as a community center. And that was really the beginning of OPCC. We were not incorporated until several years later in 1963. But for the first few years, the community center, and I know when most people think of a community center, you think of basketball courts and swimming pools. And this was a community center in the sense of it really being a place of gathering for people who lived in the neighborhood. And we started off by providing um, some very basic um, things. We provided groceries to families. We provided clothing. We provided a, a meeting spot for people who lived in the community um, to find jobs or housing. We provided childcare, which doesn't seem that novel now, but 45 years ago, cooperative childcare was really non-existent for working families. Um, and we provided activities for what today we would identify as at-risk youth. In those days, it was just kids hanging around after school getting into trouble because they didn't have anything to do. And that was really the genesis of our organization. Um, through the 1960s, OPCC um, continued um, to be known as the place in the community that was the resource center. Um, and as the community changed, as the demographics of the community changed, as Ocean Park changed, um, the, our organization sort of morphed into this multifaceted social service agency that we are today. Um, we, our first project was then called the Drop-In Center, um, which was a place where people who lived in the neighborhood basically every day came by and um, got whatever they needed, whether it was information or referrals or if we had food or we had clothing or donated items. Um, and, and that was kind of the hub of the activity in, in the community. Um, in the mid to late 1970s, when the women's movement really started to take hold and domestic violence um, became um, more uh, well known, uh, we actually formed Sojourn Services for Battered Women and Their Children in 1977. We actually have the second oldest crisis shelter, domestic violence crisis shelter in the state of California. And that started because the volunteers who were working at the drop-in center noticed that when they came to open up in the morning, there were women, and often women with children, parked in the parking lot. 
these were not necessarily homeless women, but it was clear that they didn't have any place to go. And as the volunteers began to talk to them, they realized that these were women who were fleeing their batterers. So what would happen is there would be an incidence of domestic violence in the household at night. The batterer would either fall asleep or leave, and the woman would take her kids, and she would come to OPCC because it was known in the community as a safe place. And she would wait until the morning until the batterer left, and then she would return home. So it didn't take very long before our volunteers figured out that we needed to do something to create a, a, a safety net, essentially, for these women and children. In the 1980s, as, as homelessness became the social phenomenon that we understand it to be, and unfortunately, I'm looking around this room, and your generation, I'm, I'm older than I think probably everybody in here, your generation has grown up with homelessness as a, as a state of being. But when I was growing up, um, it was not, we did not have wide-scale homelessness. Uh, it really started um, in the late 1970s and early 1980s with the, and, and actually the movement started here in California with the deinstitutionalization of people with mental illness. We had a state mental hospital system that wasn't, you know, terrific. Certainly there were a lot of abuses, but the, the mental um, health system, state mental health system was dismantled with the promise that there would be community resources so that people could live in the community with adequate housing and supportive services. Well, the problem is the first part of the equation happened, that is the institutions were shut down, but the community support system and housing never followed, and that really started a wave across the country of massive numbers of people, many of whom are severely and persistently mentally ill, living on the streets. So over the years, in the last 43 years, OPCC um, has, broaden our scope of services, and today we serve about 8,400 unduplicated individuals every year throughout our, our programs. We serve low-income and homeless, youth, adults, and families, battered women and their children, and people living with mental illness, particularly homeless, mentally ill women. And we do that through a variety of different projects, and I'll kind of quickly walk through those um, for you. We have our access center, which is, used to be called the drop-in center, which is really the point of entry into the service system here. And every day we see about 300 people who come in. Um, in every permutation of humanity, we see people who are newly homeless, we see families, we see individuals, we see single parents with children, we see folks who have been on the streets for a short period of time, folks who have been on the streets for a long period of time, people who are facing eviction, and kind of everybody in between. So we just see a wide variety of folks. And we haven't moved very far from our sort of core values. OPCC operates on the first tenet of social work, which is you meet people where they're at, you begin there, and, and, and help people and support people in making the choices they need to change their lives. So that might be something as simple as somebody needs something to eat or needs a shower or a clean um, pair of jeans or a set of clothing. They might need bus tokens for transportation. Um, they might need assistance in getting to see a, a doctor for medical care. They might need mental health treatment or substance abuse treatment. They might need help finding a job. Really kind of whatever someone needs is what we do at the Access Center. Um, we have our own mental health center because so many of the people we serve, over 73% of the people that we work with are people who are living with mental illness. Um, we have our own therapist on staff, so we have a counseling center that's available to the clients in all the OPCC programs as well as um, we see people living in the community who are not part of our programs who come in for um, counseling, particularly because we have a specialty in family violence. We see a lot of um, victims of domestic violence or victims of violent crime who come to us who have experienced trauma um, because we have an expertise in that area. So we have our own therapists and we also have about 12 interns in training. These are people who are getting their license and um, need to get their clinical hours. Um, we have a program for homeless mentally ill women called Daybreak. Um, which has a, a drop-in center, a day center, and it's a program specifically focused on the needs of women. Again, one of the things that's kind of unique about OPCC is that over the years, because we're so close to the work, our staff and volunteers are very good at assessing the changes in the needs of the people that we're serving. And several years ago at the Access Center, um, there were a group of volunteers and staff members who noticed that there were a lot of women who were coming to the Access Center, but they wouldn't actually come inside. They would stay outside. And as we began to talk with these women, we, we found out pretty quickly that these were women who were 
most of them were mentally ill. All of them had been physically or sexually assaulted by men and were very mistrustful of coming into an environment um, where there were uh, predominantly men, in some cases some of the same men that they had to deal with on the streets. So we started this program where the women had their own space um, that's staffed by women, both women staff members and volunteers, where they can feel safe. Um, and that was the beginning of Daybreak, and now Daybreak has, has sort of evolved into its own continuum. We have a day center, we have a transitional housing program, we have permanent supportive housing, and we have an aftercare program. Um, Sojourn, our services for domestic violence, uh, battered women and their children, um, operates uh, a crisis shelter, a second stage shelter. We have a very extensive community outreach and education program. We're, all, we're, we're very interested in not just treating the symptoms, but trying to intervene early on. And that's true in our work with homelessness as well, is to try to stop homelessness. So we work on the prevention side as well as actually working with people who are actually homeless or have or trying to intervene before a situation escalates into um, a battery. Um, we have a program called Canine Connection, um, which actually is our newest program, and it's, it's, I see Donna smiling back there. This, this is kind of one of our happy, all of our work is, is happy work, but we really like this one. It, it actually pairs at-risk youth with shelter dogs, and um, it's a very interesting program. It's, uh, some people think of it as a dog rescue, um, program, and it's really not. It's a child rescue um, program, because what we do is we work with primarily middle school youth um, who are, have been identified as being at risk or who have come from violent households or experienced trauma or having a hard time at school, and we pair them with shelter dogs. Um, and the goal here is really twofold. The, the dogs are really a modality to reach the kids. So what the kids do is they work with these dogs over an intensive three-week period and prepare the dogs for adoption. And through that process, they learn nonviolent conflict resolution, they learn goal setting, they learn to how to care for um, some, something other than themselves. And it's actually a fascinating process. I, you know, this project's been going a little over a year, and the very first program we did, we pair eight kids with eight dogs. And um, the first um, day of the program, I went to the site, they, they were working in a, a continuation school, and there were eight out of control kids paired with eight out of control dogs. And I thought, this is a recipe for disaster. What have we done? You know, these, these dogs are gonna bite these kids, it's gonna be a mess. Three weeks later at the graduation, so it's every day for three weeks, it's, it's three hours a day, part classroom work with the kids and part field work with the dogs. At the end of the three weeks, it was an amazing transformation. I mean, you can't believe um, what happens in terms of the, the change in behavior and attitude in, in just that three-week period. So we're actually very excited about that, that project and, and are looking to grow that. Um, we have Turning Point, our transitional housing program, um, which is a 55-bed facility here in Santa Monica that serves um, formerly homeless uh, adult men and women, and Safe Haven, which is a, a, new, a fairly new program for us. Um, we'll be expanding our bed capacity this year from 10 to 25 beds that works with homeless people with mental illness and addiction, substance addiction, or often referred to as co-occurring disorders. Um, so that's sort of the technical rundown of OPCC, and um, before everybody goes to sleep, because I know it's after lunch, um, I want to talk a little bit about why are people homeless, um, what are we doing about it, what's the city doing about it. You probably heard terms like continuum of care, or housing first, or these kinds of things. So I want to talk a little bit about that, and then I want to open it up for any questions that you have. Um, the, uh, why are people homeless? Well, there are lots of reasons why people are homeless. Um, uh, not surprisingly, and those of you that are fortunate enough to live in Santa Monica know that the cost of housing here is incredibly high. And the, the cost of housing in Los Angeles is incredibly high. So we have a real problem with affordable housing generally, even for people who are working. So imagine if you're living on the streets and general relief, which is welfare, is about $221 a month. If you're lucky enough to get Social Security income, you might get maybe $752 a month. So imagine trying to live on, pay your rent, pay your bills, buy food, forget paying for a car because most of the people that we work with are, are, can't even imagine having a car. So it's incredibly difficult um, for people just in this housing market. So certainly the lack of affordable housing. Um, 
as I said, about 73% of the people we work with have severe and persistent mental illness. That's a huge factor in people who are homeless. And if you go out and about in Santa Monica, you'll see many people, you know, probably who, who fit a lot of the stereotypes that many of us have about homeless people. They're disheveled, they may be talking to themselves, they may not um, have bathed for a long time, they might be pushing a shopping cart or have a lot of their belongings or hoarding stuff. Um, this is sort of the image that we have of, of most homeless people. What I can tell you is that for every one of those people, there are about 10 people who are invisibly homeless, who come to our facilities every day, who take a shower. Um, we have storage facilities where they can, if they're looking for a job or in some cases going to work, and yeah, there are lots of homeless people that actually do work. Um, they'll put their duffel bag or their suitcase on wheels in the storage locker, will come at 6 o'clock in the morning, take a shower, store their stuff, go to their job, come back in the evening, you know, get their stuff while they're waiting to get into some kind of a housing arrangement. So for every one person that you see on the street who's, who, who sort of fits your stereotype of homelessness, there are about 10 people behind that person who are going on about their business and you would never know that they were homeless. In many cases going, to, as I said, going to work or going to school, looking for a job, involved in some kind of employment training. Um, the lack of, of good paying jobs is another reason for homelessness. Domestic violence is a huge um, cause. Most of the women that we work with um, have been victims of domestic violence. So they've been in a, in a stable living situation at some point, or maybe not so stable, but they were housed um, and decided that it was too much and they needed to get out of it. Um, so we find that there are all kinds of reasons. Addiction is probably the other you know, primary issue, or mental illness and addiction. Uh, and for those of you that are not familiar with um, severe and persistent mental illness, I'm talking about things like severe depression or bipolar disorder, which used to be called manic depressive, where people will have real highs and real lows. A lot of people will use drugs and alcohol as a way to self-medicate. So if you're, for instance, a paranoid schizophrenic and you don't have access to medication, it wouldn't be uncommon for you perhaps to drink because when you drink, your, your symptoms subside. The problem is when you sober up, the symptoms come back with a vengeance. So it's sort of a vicious cycle that you're, you're constantly self-medicating to control your symptoms and you get caught you know, like the hamster on the wheel. You can't get off because you're, you're constantly going up and down. Um, also, the proliferation of highly addictive and, and relatively cheap street drugs, crystal meth, crack cocaine, um, these, these are things that are fairly easy to get a hold of. They're not that expensive. They're very, very addictive. And so people will get hooked on this, this stuff. Um, and it's very, very hard to break the cycle. Um, and then finally, economic reasons. I mean, we see a fair amount of families um, coming to our access center where um, through divorce, through death, um, it's, it's not uncommon to have a, a primary breadwinner who dies and then the woman is left in a situation where maybe she hasn't worked for a long time or their children to take care of and there's no income in the family. So they're housed, they're living right on the edge, they're not able to pay their rent and pretty soon they're evicted and find themselves on the street. So um, I don't want to leave you with the impression that every homeless person on the street is mentally ill and drug addicted and, and um, that sounds an awful lot like victim blaming. Um, but it is certainly um, a significant reason for um, what we see in terms of chronic homeless um, people. What I mean by chronically homeless people, I mean people who have been on the streets for a year or longer, um, or, who have, or who are living with a disability, or who have been homeless more than four times in the last three years. So we're talking about people who have had, it maybe have been in and out of shelter temporarily, but have not been in a stable living situation for quite a long time. What is the city doing? about this. Well, the city actually, the city of Santa Monica is probably one of the um, most generous cities in terms of their support for homeless services, not just OPCC, but on the west side there's a coalition of agencies called the West Side Shelter and Hunger Coalition, which has about 20, over 25 members that are a combination of service providers and faith-based organizations that are involved in serving homeless people, and that includes everything from organizations like OPCC that have a very broad range of services within our organization to faith communities who might be providing meals or in many cases providing volunteer support to support the agencies. We have organizations here that serve families. We have an organization that works um, specifically on employment um, placement um, for people. We have 
um, an organization that works with seniors. Um, and together, the organizations try to fill out what's called this continuum of care, where you think of emergency services on the front end and permanent housing on the other end, and helping people kind of move through that system. Um, the city of Santa Monica right now um, commits uh, about, I believe it's about $2 million a year of their general fund revenue uh, to um, homeless services. Um, and it's just recently um, focused on creating two new programs. One's called the Chronic Homeless um, Pilot, um, and that is a collaboration between service providers, the police department, paramedics, um, and human services, city human services staff, to identify individuals who have been the highest utilizers of services. These are the folks that get the most police calls, paramedic calls, use hospital emergency room services, and really intensifying our efforts to work with these people and get them into housing with supportive services. The pilot's been going a little over a year now. We started off with a about 20 individuals who had been targeted. We have now 71 people enrolled in the program. 36 of them have been housed. Um, so it's, uh, it's a very labor intensive um, uh, program, but it also is extremely effective in terms of, of providing services to people who have been the hardest to reach. Um, finally, I just want to talk a little bit about volunteer opportunities, and then I want to open it up and answer any questions that you have. Um, for volunteering at OPCC, we love volunteers. We have right now about a, a, a core of about 700 volunteers throughout our agency that work in a variety of, of ways. And that can be anything from um, preparing um, the sack lunches to helping with the grocery program um, to doing administrative work. Donna always needs help um, at our fundraisers. We're always looking for folks who want to help out at special events. Um, Sojourn, our domestic violence program, is always looking for volunteers to work on our hotline, to work with the OCEAN team, to work in our children's program. We have actually groups of, of folks who come and prepare and serve um, meals at our various locations. So if you're interested in doing that as an individual, we can hook you up with another group. Or if a group of you from Google were interested in forming your own group, that would be a wonderful way to be of service to us. Um, there are opportunities internally. You could do things like a clothing drive, um, canned food drive. Um, for those of you that travel or know people who travel, we love those small bottles of shampoo and conditioners and lotions and toothpaste that you often get in hotels because we give those to our clients. Um, so there are all kinds of ways of being involved. And I know that time is something that's precious for everybody, um, but we would really, really welcome and encourage you to think about you know, if you could carve out a little bit of time, whether it was weekly or monthly or every couple of months, um, to do some volunteer work, um, not only would it help us, but frankly, I think it would be good for you too. Because I, what I hear from the volunteers, and I can tell you from my own experience, because I'm, in addition to, you know, my vocation, my avocation is being a volunteer. And I can tell you that it's, it's good for your soul. It gets you outside of yourself, and it, you know, it makes you realize um, first of all, it helps you with your stereotypes in terms of who homeless people are, because I think that we all sort of have an image. You know, sometimes we've had negative experiences with homeless people, and so we think that all homeless people are just like that person. But you actually might be amazed and surprised to know um, that, that everybody has a life story and that we don't often know um, what people's stories are, that often there's catastrophe or trauma or something dramatic happens in someone's life that leads them down a path that results in them being homeless. So being a volunteer is a good way for you to kind of get the other side of the story and also to give back a little bit because I think all of us that are fortunate enough to go home at night and lay our heads on a pillow with a roof over our head um, often take that for granted. Um, and so I think being a volunteer also gives you an opportunity to see that you know the whole world isn't as fortunate as, as we are. Um, so that's kind of my quick spiel. Um, what would you like to know? What questions do you have about OPCC, about homelessness, about what do you want to talk about? Yes, sir. So uh, I'm a little more interested in, uh, you mentioned briefly uh, some stuff that uh, you're doing with other West Side uh, agencies. I'm a little more interested in that because well, you know, we're, you know, we're in Santa Monica, but uh, the people around here are from all over the Los Angeles. Community. Homeless individuals from Los Angeles. Well, and uh, 
people in this office. Oh, people in the office. So you're, you're interested in what other agencies are around, you mean? Is that the question? Yeah, and, and how you work with them and work together. Oh, well, the agencies work very well together, actually. And I'll just give you a sampling of you know, some of the agencies. From Monica, we have, there's OPCC. Right over the border in Venice is St. Joseph Center. Um, just up the street here, we have Upward Bound House, which is at 11th and Washington, which is a program. They have um, two programs, one a senior housing program and one a, a, a program for homeless families. There's Chrysalis, which is the employment agency that I talked about. They have a Santa Monica office and also they're based downtown. There's New Directions, um, which is based at the West LA VA campus, and they serve um, homeless veterans, both men and women. Um, we have the Clara Foundation, which is also based here in Santa Monica, which is a substance abuse treatment um, provider. We have the Westside Food Bank, which works actually with all the agencies, provides food um, to support all the agencies' programs. Um, we have um, Step Up on Second, which is right down here downtown. They um, have um, permanent housing as well as a little, some of you may have been in the little Fresh Start Market. They have a catering business um, that employs um, their clients, and they also have a little um, like a mini market, um, and they're building um, some new housing right down on 5th Street, I believe 46 units um, as well. So that's just sort of a sampling of, of some of the agencies that are around. Then in addition to that, as I mentioned, we have several of the faith-based um, organizations, which are, uh, for the most part, not providing direct services, but are providing groups of volunteers. For instance, in our programs, we have several um, faith-based groups that come in on the weekends and prepare and serve the evening meals at Turning Point, at Sam Shell, at Daybreaks. We have um, folks who, who will do that, and, and many of them are affiliated with faith-based organizations. Um, so does, that, does that answer your question, kind of give you a better idea? So there are lots of volunteer opportunities. So if you live outside Santa Monica, um, certainly in the San Fernando Valley, there's um, LA Family Housing. I mean, they're great. They're great organizations all over LA County. So if you live in the South Bay or Long Beach or wherever San Gabriel Valley, there are, there are plenty of opportunities to be involved. Yes. Also, compared with places like uh, Orange County, you drive down there, it's not as, at least it's not as visible. What is it about uh, Santa Monica and certain other places that tend to attract homeless people? And is it, uh, is it because the resources are here to help them? Is it because I've heard, of, I've heard of a story a while back about um, police were accused of uh, driving driving homeless people to downtown Los Angeles and dropping them off. Uh, I mean, what are, I mean, there's probably more than one reason, but yeah, no, I wanted you to talk about that. It's an excellent question. Um, Let's rewind a little bit in terms of, particularly downtown Los Angeles, to understand Skid Row, because the history of Los Angeles is very much linked to Skid Row. And if you go to other urban areas, you'll see homeless people, and generally there's, there's homelessness in the urban cores of the cities, um, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, um, and, and that's usually where you find what are called single room occupancy, SRO hotels. Um, in Los Angeles, the only place that we have SRO hotels are in downtown in the Skid Row area, and the reason for that is because years ago, really at the turn of, before the turn of the century, the railroad terminus ended right near Skid Row. And so you had a lot of these hotels, which were boarding houses originally. They were developed for primarily single men coming to Los Angeles to work. And so they would rent rooms in these boarding houses. Over the years, as Los Angeles grew and we became really a, a suburban um, city, the urban core where the SRO hotels were remained in downtown and in Skid Row. So homeless people, that was really where most of the affordable housing has been historically in Los Angeles. And so down there you have a lot of the missions uh, and the faith-based organizations kind of in this urban core because most homeless people were living in and around, or very low income people were living in and around the downtown core. So that's sort of the history, and I'm giving an oversimplified version, but essentially that's how Skid Row sort of developed. 
Now, relative to Santa Monica, people say, well, if you go to Manhattan or Redondo or any of the other beach communities, you don't see as many homeless people. Why is that? Well, there are a couple things that are different about Santa Monica. Yes, those other communities have beaches, but Santa Monica, first of all, is a world-class tourist destination. So you have infrastructure here to support tourism that you don't have in a lot of those other cities. You, you, know, you have the volleyball tournament or the surfing championship, but other than that, you don't have year-round tourism. There are a lot of European tourists that come here, a lot of Japanese tourists that come here. So we have the promenade, we have beachfront hotels, we've developed the pier, and so we have infrastructure here that you don't have necessarily in other beach communities. So that's part of it. The weather is more temperate here. I live in the San Fernando Valley, and for those of you that live in the valley or have been out there in the summertime, it's very, very hot. And so if you go in the San Fernando Valley, of course, I'm very aware of this because of the work that I do. There are certainly pockets of homeless people. I live fairly close to Cal State Northridge, and there are a fair amount of encampments, actually, in that area. But most of the homeless people in the San Fernando Valley congregate along the 405 or the 101 corridors. Why? Well, if people are going to panhandle, you know, where are they asking for money? They're generally asking for money off the freeway off-ramp when you're making a left-hand turn, right? Well, here you don't have to do that because you can go down along the promenade because we have a very bustling tourist trade and a lot of street traffic all the time. So we have a lot, we have a tourist industry that has nothing to do with homeless people but makes it easier for people who are living on the streets to survive. So that's, that's a factor. The fact is we do have services in Santa Monica that we don't have other places. And as a service provider, one of the things we hear all the time is, well, if you would just go away, it's like the Pied Piper syndrome. If you'd go away, all the homeless people would kind of follow you out of town. Well, certainly some of the homeless people would follow us out of town, but the vast majority of them wouldn't because, and we know this from our own studies that we've done, is particularly women and families will stay here because it's safer to be on the streets here than it is in downtown Los Angeles, a very scary and dangerous place. So a lot of the women, particularly, will come here and stay here because this is a city that's pretty, the weather is reasonably temperate. It's easy to get around on foot. We have a very good and inexpensive public transportation system. A lot of our female clients actually will ride the big blue bus at night until the route ends. They'll actually sleep on the bus because they feel safe there. Um, so you don't have that in other parts you know, of, of the county. So that's certainly you know, a factor. Um, and beyond that, um, the other thing that we have on the west side that you don't have in other places is we have a very large um, VA um, complex in West Los Angeles. So you have a fair number of homeless veterans who go to the VA for services or for health care services, and so they will come and stay in or around Santa Monica or on the west side because the campus is there. So it's sort of the flip side of their services available there. Um, there is what we've seen happening in the last two years with the redevelopment of downtown Los Angeles is the loft conversions began to, a lot of those SRO hotels are being converted to market rate housing. So I started off by saying that one of the reasons that we have such problem with homelessness is that affordable housing is drying up and as more and more that housing stock is converted, it's going to be harder and harder for people to find places where they can afford to live. So. They, we're not really solving anything, we're just kind of pushing it out. And so if you go now to areas of you know, South Los Angeles, San Gabriel Valley, as I said, the San Fernando Valley, um, the, it's becoming more dispersed in terms of the county because people are getting pushed out of the downtown area. And, and a natural place to gravitate is um, to Santa Monica. The other thing, too, that is important and unique about Santa Monica that you don't have in the other beach communities, if you look at the MTA, the, the master transportation grid for the MTA, the bus system, we have four main east-west bus routes that literally end at the beach and go to downtown. You, know, you have Wilshire, Santa Monica, Olympic, and Pico. You can get on a bus and ride literally from the beach to downtown Los Angeles. That's not true in any other beach community. There's not direct access to downtown. So that, that also, in terms of transportation patterns, makes it easier for people to kind of get back and forth. So all of those, for all of those reasons. Yes? I mean, are there some reasons that downtown is more dangerous than Santa Monica? And, and also, um, you know, as we are sort of new to the neighborhood here, we've noticed uh, obviously lots of homeless um, folks that we come in contact with when we're walking to our cars at night in remote parking situations. And um, just would love to, to understand your, um, you know, if you have any statistics or any information on 
um, you know, how safe it is or not safe it is or what the... Well, to answer the first part of the question, why is downtown more dangerous than Santa Monica? Probably a lot of people concentrated in a very small area and if you've been to downtown recently it's get, Skid Row is becoming more and more and more compressed. For a long time there was sort of this attitude of containment and it was contained within about at one time probably about a 30 block radius and that's down to about 10 square blocks now so you're just compressing people more and more that's one issue. The second issue is that a lot of the criminal activity that happens occasionally happens between homeless people but it's often drug dealers or people who are not homeless who prey on homeless people because the 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 trade of the street often is drug dealing that's how people in some cases survive but there's a lot of predatory behavior for people who as i said are not homeless drug dealers will come and sell crack or crystal meth or a combination of all that stuff to homeless people and so that creates this in a sort of perpetual cycle of criminal activity. Um, so you have a lot of people living in a dense area, you have a lot of, of people who are already addicted, who are living with severe and persistent mental illness, then you put on top of that this you know, illegal drug activity, and it's, it's really just kind of a breeding ground for problems. So we don't have that in Santa Monica. Yes, there are pockets. I'm not saying that there's no criminal activity that goes on with homeless people here. There's no drug dealing, certainly there is, but the police department here is much more focused on enforcement, not punishing people. It's not illegal to, you know, to be homeless or not to have a place to live. So if you're, you know, sitting or walking or standing with your belongings and you're not panhandling, you're not sleeping in a doorway, you're not bothering anybody, you know, the police are not going to arrest you because it's not a crime, you know, not to have a place to live. Um, but in Santa Monica, the, the police are much more active, um, and actually we have been um, involved in helping them near our access center um, because we have so many people every day coming into a very small space that we have found that some of the outside influences that I described, who are not even people who live in Santa Monica but come from downtown or come from other areas, you know, will come to engage in criminal activity and we don't want that. We don't, it's not good for our clients, it's not good for the community, it's not good for us. So here we have a, a police force that's much more involved in stopping that kind of activity before it, it, it becomes out of control. So that's a major difference. In terms of violent crimes, homeless people are no more apt to be violent than the general population. I think what's often scary to people is when you see someone who um, is clearly, you know, not, doesn't have all their, their faculties, who may be talking to themselves, there's a perception of, of feeling threatened. And I'm not talking about somebody getting up in your face and, and actually being threaten, threatening, and, and that does happen occasionally. Um, but by and large, as a percentage of the population, there's no more violent activity cr created or perpetrated by homeless people than there is in the general population, in fact, you know, probably less. And most, most criminal activity that occurs among homeless people is either individual homeless people, one-on-one, -on -one, or as I said, drug dealers or other folks kind of coming in and preying on homeless folks. So, yes. So, uh, Santa Monica that makes a lot of sense, tourism and all the other the buses and everything. I understand now why Santa Monica is, uh, if you're homeless, it's a great, great place, maybe one of the best places to be homeless. But what I don't really understand is uh, how you overcome the challenges of finding affordable housing and uh, and jobs for the people without uh, without you know having them move to places that are more affordable. How do you how do how do they or maybe some of that happens? I don't well, know. Well, we can't. The fact is, the vast majority of the people that we serve don't end up living in Santa Monica um, because it's just and it's getting it's getting difficult to find affordable housing anywhere in Los Angeles County. So one of the first things we begin, when we begin to work with somebody, one of the first things that we put out there right up front is the likelihood of you living in Santa Monica or anywhere on the west side um, is not very likely given the high housing costs and, and just the lack of housing generally. Jobs are a little easier, because, but there are more low paying jobs. So even though somebody can go to work, they're not going to be able to sustain themselves for over a long period of time just because of the high cost of living, not just housing generally. So, but in some ways, it's, it's, it's 
it's kind of counterproductive to what we're trying to do, which is to stabilize people and build a support system and build a sense of community. Because when people put down roots, and I think most of you would experience this as well, you know, you want to be near either where you work, where your family, where your friends, where your recreational or social activities are, where you worship, if you, you know, participate in those activities. So in some ways, we are kind of encouraging people to build a life. In another way, we're saying to them from the beginning, don't put down roots you know, that are too deep here because the reality is you're probably not going to be able to afford to stay here. Um, so it's a challenge for us, it, and it's something that we struggle with all the time. We have more and more uh, uh, people um, who are moving, you know, farther and farther away because they have to, um, and that's just the reality of it. But uh, most people are willing to do that um, in order to, you know, to have housing and to be able to work or, or uh, if they're not able to work, if they're physically disabled, just to be able to have a roof over their head, they're willing to do that. Some people are not. Some people are very stubborn about it. They like it here and, and want to stay here, and, um, and that, that presents its own challenges. Some people will. It's a very, very small percentage. The majority of people, given the opportunity and the right amount of support, will choose the housing. But there are some people who will say, if it's, you know, if you want me to go live in Pomona or Antelope Valley, you know, I would rather stay here because I'm more comfortable. This is where my community is. Um, but that's that's really a very small percentage of people. Yes, sir. You mentioned. Uh Important component to uh, homelessness. What is the, what is access like to, to medication for mental illness? I mean, well, for people, there's actually. Um, I would say that anything is easy, but um, the Department of Mental Health has um, uh, the Edelman Westside Mental Health Center, which is over um, at Pico in, in Sepulveda, um, and or Olympic in Sepulveda. I'm sorry, um, and. Um, and so we have a county mental health facility on the west side that's been very proactive. Um, it's been very involved with our organization, a lot of organizations, in getting people access to treatment, to psychiatric treatment, as well as medications. So it's not, it, it's, it's not that difficult. Um, we actually have um, psychiatrists that come on site at our facilities a couple times a week and will often um, have the ability to write prescriptions. We have pharmacies locally that we'll work with that will fill them. So, you know, between Medi-Cal, between county resources, between private resources, that that really isn't a barrier, an impediment um, for someone that can get hooked up. Now, it's very hard for somebody who's homeless, who's not in treatment, to kind of navigate the system on their own. But once they're connected to services, it's not that difficult to actually get the medications. That's not it, it, it's not a primary impediment. How do you keep them on medication? Well, that's another, that's another issue. Um, the, a lot of our work is really encouraging people and educating people about, um, you know, th this is your life when you're not on medication, this is your life when you are on medication. You know, that said, we're, we're not the police. I mean, we don't, we don't force people to take their medications. Um, but again, I think given the right amount of support, and education, most people will understand that if they, if they take their medications, if they have a stable living environment, that's the other thing that's really difficult. It's, you know, it's easy for us to talk about, well, you should take your medication, but if you don't have a place to live, you know, and you can't, you can't even remember what day it is or what time it is, it's very hard to stick to any kind of a medication regimen. Um, for any of you that take medication or even take vitamins regularly, you know, sometimes you think, oh, did I take my pill this morning? It's hard to remember. So imagine somebody who's living on the streets and, you know, their, their biggest challenge is worrying about where their next meal is coming from, staying safe or getting from point A to point B or, you know, last night, you know, anybody living on the street when it's pouring rain just trying to figure out a place to get out of the rain. So. Um, what we have experienced, and we work with a lot of people with mental illness, is once people understand how the medication can help them and what the treatment you know, can do in terms of, of helping them manage their life, and they have a stable environment, um, then it's much easier to get people. Then, then, then it just becomes routine. So, Yes? This process, and I'm probably oversimplifying this, uh, admittedly, 
but it kind of in this process in that uh, that you've kind of described this transition for folks from uh, kind of the emergency care, you know, all the way into getting them placed, you know, in a home in a stable uh, situation. Um, how defined is that process? And I'm sure that different groups may define it differently. And then, uh, then, then I guess my next question is: is is it identifiable kind of in that process where the big bottlenecks, and, you know, where do people get stuck along that transition? And, and that's probably where I'm probably simplifying. It may not be as easy to, to be able to define well, that. Yeah, the, I, I, there are a couple ways to answer that question. I would say the continuum is very fluid for us because we recognize that people come in at different points and at different levels of functioning with different levels of need. Um, so we try to make it as easy as possible for people to get into the system. And one of the reasons why we operate so many different programs targeting so many different individual groups is we recognize that one size fits all doesn't work. If you're a pretty highly functioning person not living with mental illness that found yourself homeless as a result of a, a job loss, for instance, that's a very different situation. And will will your, your, your road to being housed and probably employed again is much shorter and probably easier than somebody who's been living on the streets for 15 years with untreated mental illness and or addiction. I mean, so you can't say that, you know, everybody is the same. Um, in terms of the continuum of care, I really described it as sort of a very linear process. I think the downside of the continuum is that it, it doesn't work well for people who can't move through a system in a pretty linear fashion because it presupposes that you have emergency housing, people kind of get in off the streets, have a place you know, temporarily to be stabilized, move to transitional housing, and that's where the, kind of the bulk of the work begins. People save money, look for a job, really kind of get their life together, and then on to permanent housing where they're able to function and, and live independently. So for, for people who are able to kind of do that, it works really well. The problem um, is, is that there isn't enough capacity in the system at any level. So on any, you know, we see 300 people a day coming through our access center. On a good day, on a good day, there might be 25 beds available for people. So if you're the 26th person, you know, today, you're out of luck until a bed opens up. So th there's, there's a huge system, and that's not our fault. I mean, it's just that there just aren't enough beds for people. We have 2,000 homeless people on the streets of Santa Monica. We have, you know, the bed capacity in this city, um, you know, is, is less than 400. Um, so, you know, that's, that's not a really great ratio on any given night. So that's, that's just a systemic problem. The other thing is, is there are, you know, sometimes because of program requirements, um, people are not able to meet the program requirements. You know, people may not be willing to commit to being clean and sober upon entry, or may be willing to commit to do that, but if any of you have ever, you know, struggled with addiction, you know that relapse is part of recovery, that people don't always get there, again, in a linear fashion. Sometimes, you know, it takes a while till people are ready. So, and that, that creates its own barriers because a lot of programs will say, well, if you're not willing to be clean and sober, then you can't be here. Um, so I think, I think it's both a systems capacity issue and I also think that there are barriers within the system that, that make it difficult for people. Does that answer your question? Yeah, well, I, I wasn't expecting one single answer. Oh, <laughs> one size fits all doesn't work, yeah, yeah. no. We work with humans and everybody's different. Individuals or groups organized around preparing and serving food and meals is a huge need that we have in our organization now. Um, SAMO Shell, which is an acronym for Santa Monica Shelter, is one of our programs. It's a 110 bed facility down on Olympic and Fifth. We're in desperate need of volunteers to come in, and we have a kitchen there, so we, but we need the volunteers, and what we ask the groups to do is to actually bring the food in and you know prepare it. We have the kitchen there. We'll, set up and we'll even do the dishes, but um, we really need help um, th in that particular area. Um, 
The other thing too is um, volunteers who might be able to teach any kind of classes. We have, I talked about Daybreak, which is our program for um, women. Um, they have a, a, um, a program called Women in New Directions, which is a, a um, arts and crafts business that the women actually run, created and run as a micro enterprise. So we're always looking for volunteer instructors. So if you have any artistic ability, um, that's helpful. Um, I'm in a room full of techies, so um, technology is always, uh, we're limping into the 19th century. Um, so, you know, people who are available to, to teach basic computer um, skills is always very helpful because we, you know, have a lot of people who um, are not that familiar um, with technology. Um, these, you have to be fairly patient because these are not advanced, um, you know, folks who are going to be advanced in, in computer literacy. Um, but if you had an inclination to do that, that would be very helpful for us. Um, then beyond that, sort of internally, always organizing food drives. We always need food. You know, canned food, non-perishable foods um, are a big thing for us. And personal hygiene items. We, we blow through that stuff. I mean, it's, it's enormous in how much we, we go through. So we're always grateful for that. So I would say those are the, and money. I mean, that's, that's the other thing. If people are so inclined, that that's you know, something that we can always use as well to run our program, so. Other questions? No? You said, thank God he's gonna stop talking, huh? Okay, well, if you have any other questions, Don and I are here and we're more than happy to talk to you. And I really do, first of all, welcome you to Santa Monica. I know you've been here for a while, but um, it's nice to have you as neighbors. And I also hope that you'll use OPCC as a resource. So one thing that you should know is that we do have um, two outreach teams, mobile outreach teams, um, that work out of our access center. So if you would ever encounter a homeless person who needed help, um, you can call us. And we actually, we're not the police. We don't go out and arrest people. Um, but we have um, very skilled, um, a lot, the other thing that's important for you to know is about a third of our staff at OPCC are people who have been formerly homeless, who are living with mental illness, or who are in recovery, or some combination thereof. So we have a lot of our staff members who are not only sympathetic, but tremendously empathetic, because they've been there, they know what it's like. As, as one of our staff members said last week, he said, you know, when you're laying in the gutter and looking up in the curb, it looks awfully high sometimes. So. Um, but I hope that you will use us as a community resource that we do have the ability to, to come out and talk to people and encourage them to come in for services. Um, and um, so um, we're, we're here um, for, as a resource for you as well. So thank you very much for having us.